Hello everyone, welcome back for part two of the video series where we will now take a deep dive into the table two fallacy. This is me. As introduced in part one, the paper by Westerreich and Greenland titled The Table Two Fallacy, Presenting and Interpreting Confounder and Modifier Coefficients is the main source of information that we will use to discuss the issue of the Table 2 fallacy. This paper was published in 2013 in the American Journal of Epidemiology. Also, as introduced at the end of part one, this is an example, Table 2, which typically depicts a multivariable model in an epidemiologic study. And in this multivariable model, you can see the adjusted measure of effect in this case, an adjusted risk ratio for our exposure of interest, which is injection drug use in this study, and our outcome, food insecurity. Also, you can see many other adjusted measures of effect or other adjusted risk ratios for the various confounding variables that we adjusted for in this analysis. And this is based on a paper I published back in 2018. Again, just to reiterate, this multivariable model, as depicted in Table 2, is examining the relationship between IDU as a behavior, food insecurity as an outcome, and in order to quantify this relationship, we adjust for a variety of socioeconomic, sociodemographic, behavioral, and clinical confounding factors. Going back to the introductory sentences of the Table 2 fallacy paper's abstract, they talk about it being common to present multiple adjusted effect estimates, as just shown in the previous example table, from a single model in a single table. And that this can lead to mistaken interpretations of these estimates. Now here I'm showing the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of the word fallacy. And in my interpretation of the Table 2 fallacy paper, when you interpret several adjusted measures of effect, such as adjusted odds ratios or adjusted risk ratios from a single table, you get false, mistaken, erroneous, deceptive, and invalid conclusions. And in my view, it is trickery. In addition to the Westerreich and Greenland Table 2 fallacy paper, I also find this write-up on the Daggety website quite useful. And just in case you're wondering, Daggety is a website that allows you to create conceptual frameworks, or more specifically, directed acyclic graphs, which you can then use to inform your epidemiologic study. On their Table 2 fallacy page, they talk about covariates, or variables, in a statistical analysis such as a regression model, playing a variety of roles. However, from a statistical perspective in models, there are only two types of variables. The dependent variable, or the outcome variable, as well as independent variables. And among the independent variables, these variables can be given a variety of roles or a variety of labels. And they state that the table two fallacy is largely a misrepresentation, or I would view it as an overinterpretation of the variables or of the measures of effect in a multivariable model, which again is typically depicted in a table two. They also talk about mutual adjustment, recently called the table two fallacy, which, well, I, which I will dive into later in the slides. Going back to the example table two, which you have seen many times, we are displaying a multivariable model, a single multivariable model with an adjusted risk ratio for the exposure of interest, which in this case was injection drug use, where the adjusted risk ratio is 1.15. And we also have adjusted risk ratios for all the confounding variables that were included, included in this model. And I've highlighted a random selection of them here. However, what's important to know, while we know IDU is the exposure and that all the other variables are confounders in the model, from a statistical perspective, all these variables are referred to as independent variables. 
Now going back to the clarification made on the Daggety website, we can have a dependent variable, which is our outcome of interest, such as food and security. And we also have a variety of independent variables. The model does not know which independent variable is the exposure or which are the confounders. Only you, the researcher or the reader of a paper, know which role each independent variable is playing. Therefore, it's important to have a to have a hypothesized reality of the relationship under study or a conceptual framework where you've reviewed the literature and attempted to understand how your exposure is associated with your outcome. And after doing this, you should assign specific roles to each of your independent variables of interest. And these specific roles, whether they're exposures, confounders, or potentially affect modifiers, dictate what we interpret from our multivariable model and what we do not interpret. And again, this multivariable model is typically depicted in the table two of an epidemiologic study. Clearly, in terms of models of reality, everything plays a role in these different models. Up on the top left, it is clear what the wheels are versus what the side mirrors are. In this model or visual depiction of a new hospital being built in Vancouver, they've identified which buildings are for patient care versus which buildings are for epidemiologic or health research. And in the bottom right, we can see that clearly there is a main house in this model as well as a side garage. And don't ask me what the model in the bottom left is attempting to depict. In terms of epidemiology, we also have models of reality, which can be very simple. As shown in the top left, we have our exposure and our outcome and confounding factors which are associated with both of these variables that may introduce bias. But we could also draw much more complex diagrams, also known as directed acyclic graphs, that allow us to see the potential relationships between our exposures of interest and our outcome and all the potential backdoor paths or confounding variables that we may have to consider. And these can range from very simple diagrams or more simple diagrams to something much more complicated. And for example, the website Daggety can be used to create the diagram on the bottom left. Just to make sure we are on the same page, table two usually depicts a multivariable model designed to estimate an unbiased effect of our exposure, which is typically one of several independent variables in our model. The table two fallacy is largely an overinterpretation of our multivariable model. Mutual adjustment is the false belief that all variables have a similar or identical role with respect to the relationship that we are examining. In the case of the table two fallacy, we are ignoring the hypothesized reality that we are trying to capture, and our model is no longer reflecting a conceptual framework or a diagram. And in this case, we are ignoring the specific roles of the variables in our model. For example, we are treating confounders as exposures and exposures as confounders. Now here are some screenshots from the Table 2 fallacy paper, and I'm going to clarify why I've written the words interpreting above presenting in a moment. But Westerreich and Greenland talk about the Table 2 fallacy being harmful because it suggests that all the estimates or all of the measures of effect in the multivariable model can be interpreted in the same way. And they say that this is not the case. Down at the bottom, they say that the table two fallacy or not assigning roles to variables in your model and then interpreting those estimates as if they're all the same can lead readers astray in a number of ways. And we're going to unpack these ideas in the following slides. However, I want to make one quick clarification 
that you should be aware of when reading the Table 2 fallacy paper. The authors frame the issue as being one of presenting multiple effect estimates, such as adjusted odds ratios or risk ratios, in a single model. And they say that the solution, as I will show you, is to not do this. Do not present multiple adjusted ORs or RRs for the confounders in your table too. And to essentially list them by name in a footnote without giving the measures of effect for the confounders. This is not untrue. I do not disagree with this. Obviously, if you do not present the adjusted odds ratios or risk ratios for the confounders, it is then not possible for you as the author or for the reader of the study to commit the table two fallacy. You can't, you can't interpret multiple measures of effect from a single model if you only present one measure of effect. However, in my view, the issue is not necessarily the presentation of multiple odds ratios or risk ratios, but in the interpretation of multiple odds ratios or risk ratios. Going back to my paper and my example table two, I present several adjusted risk ratios, one for the exposure of interest, injection drug use, and others for the different confounding variables included in my adjusted or my multivariable model. Therefore, based on my reading of the Table 2 fallacy paper, this paper has the potential for a reader to commit the Table 2 fallacy and to start interpreting the, the risk ratios for the confounding variables, which are indeed shown here. However, my writing of the paper and presentation of the results, as can be seen from the abstract, make it clear that the only variable that the reader should be interpreting and drawing conclusions about is indeed the adjusted risk ratio for the exposure of interest, which in this case is injection drug use, and that all the other variables in the model, having been assigned the role of confounders, are there to adjust for confounding bias, but do not have a meaningful or logical interpretation in and of themselves. So in terms of presenting multiple measures of effect versus interpreting multiple measures of effect, while multiple adjusted risk ratios for the confounders are presented in my example, Table 2, they are in fact not interpreted. Therefore, despite presenting a Table 2 with multiple adjusted risk ratios, only one is interpreted, and there is no Table 2 fallacy in this paper, at least from the perspective of the author which was myself and my colleagues. However, it is true that this leaves the door slightly open for a reader of the paper, such as another researcher or the public media, to commit the fallacy when reading my work. However, I hope that this is unlikely given how the paper is framed. It should be very clear from the abstract down that the only risk ratio or the only effect that should be discussed or interpreted from this paper is in fact that of injection drug use's impact on food insecurity. Going back to the Table 2 fallacy paper, this is what they describe in terms of solutions or avoiding Table 2 fallacies. First and foremost, they say that a reasonable starting point for modeling is the construction or the drawing of a plausible diagram. And this diagram displays the researcher's best understanding of the problem or of the relationship that they're attempting to examine. In this case, start with a diagram. More specifically, start with a directed acyclic graph, pick your exposure, identify your outcome, and figure out which confounding variables need to be adjusted for as subsequently presented or not in your multivariable model. They also talk about table two problems being avoided by limiting the table to estimates or measures of effect for the primary exposure with the adjustment variables or the confounding variables being reported by name in a footnote. 
and I'm going to show various examples of how to avoid the table two fallacy and what this means visually in part three of this video series. So what do they mean by plausible diagrams? The question you should ask yourself is, do you want a meaningful answer from your epidemiologic study when you are attempting to examine the relationship between a given variable and an outcome? The first step is to simply draw a diagram, which can be very simple as shown in the top left or more complicated as shown on the right hand side. And in that diagram, assign specific roles to your independent variables. And through that process, give a lot of thought to the bias that could be introduced due to confounding factors that could be introducing or opening backdoor paths in your conceptual framework. Now we're going to move on to a bigger issue and we're going to use the following paper to illustrate when the table two fallacy can become even more entrenched. On the right hand side, you can see a paper known as Open Safely and it is titled as Factors Associated with COVID-19 Death in 17 Million Patients. The first author of this paper is Elizabeth Williamson and the senior or last author is a prominent writer and researcher, Ben Goldacre. This study was published in the journal Nature, a very high profile scientific journal. As of the time of making this video or taking this screenshot, it had approaching 200,000 accesses. And in this paper titled Open Safely, we have to ask ourselves the question, what if the multivariable model presented in the paper's table two is explicitly being used to estimate multiple measures of effect for many exposures. So the table two fallacy paper talks about presenting and interpreting several measures of effect from a single paper, essentially interpreting confounders as if they were exposures. However, what if a study explicitly labels all of the independent variables as exposures to begin with? This study looks at the relationship between various factors and the outcome of death due to COVID-19. And in the abstract of this nature paper, they report seven different adjusted hazard ratios. For the sake of this video, you can think of hazard ratios alongside other measures of effect, such as odds ratios or risk ratios. These authors support hazard ratios for sex, male versus female, for age, for deprivation, for diabetes, for asthma, as well as for the ethnicities of Black and South Asian. And these numbers are being used to quantify the relationship between all of these different factors being treated as exposures or risk factors and their impact on the outcome of COVID-19 death. Now we will discuss the elephant in the room, which is the table two fallacy in the context of exploratory or hypothesis generating studies. The reality is that people often commit the table two fallacy while doing exploratory or hypothesis generating research. And such researchers might say, hey, I'm not interested in causation. I'm only interested in associations. Therefore, the table two fallacy does not apply to me. The next few slides will illustrate why this is not the case. So in exploratory studies, such as studies titled factors associated with or correlates of a given outcome, such as the open safely study, you will see conclusions and statements such as this. We will use the exposures or the risk factors identified in the open safely studies abstract as examples. And while this study may not use this direct phrasing, a critique of the article, which I will discuss in a moment, highlights that many of the conclusions or statements in this paper follow the same idea. So for example, in the Open Safely study, you will see that the authors state that sex is associated with COVID-19 deaths, age is associated, deprivations associated, diabetes and asthma are associated, as well as certain ethnicities. Going back up to the first potential risk factor, 
What you will often see is authors state that because sex is associated, in this case, males are more likely to die from COVID-19, that we should do something for males, the higher risk group or the quote unquote exposed group in order to reduce COVID-19 deaths. And then subsequently in some studies, specific recommendations, whether that be for physicians or policymakers are given. Similarly, if age is associated with COVID-19 deaths, you will see studies report that something should be done for older people in order to reduce the occurrence of this outcome, and sometimes examples are given, and the same idea follows for deprivation, diabetes, asthma, and so on. In my view, there is a widespread misunderstanding in epidemiology when it comes to exploratory and hypothesis-generating studies. In other words, if you are drawing similar conclusions in your work, an exposure is associated with the outcome, therefore we should do something about the exposure in order to reduce the outcome, you are in fact interested in an underlying causal structure. And it's important to note that confounding bias does not disappear in exploratory or hypothesis generating studies even if you have not informed your model with some sort of hypothesized reality or conceptual framework. And when I say hypothesized reality, I'm referring to a diagram or an epidemiology, a directed acyclic graph, which clearly labels the exposure, the outcome, and the potential confounding factors that could bias that relationship. Specifically, if your model does not reflect the hypothesized reality, which is usually depicted using a diagram, the results from that model, the individual measures of effect, will be largely uninformative. Going back to previous examples I've used in videos on this channel, as well as part one of the Table 2 fallacy video, if you do an observational study where you do not consider confounding bias, you may find that Rolex watches, or owning a Rolex watch, will decrease your likelihood of death. And you may conclude that giving people a Rolex will in fact make them live longer. While we know this silly example is incorrect, you may draw similarly erroneous conclusions in your epi study if you do not think about the underlying structure or hypothesize realities or relationships between your exposure and your outcome. And this requires one to think about confounding bias and backdoor paths. Now we will look at the table two in the Open Safely paper where they have taken their seven measures of effect adjusted hazard ratios that they had reported in the abstract of their study. So there's seven hazard ratios for seven exposures taken from a single multivariable model, which is depicted in their table two. As we know, all of these hypothetical exposures have different relationships or hypothesized links with the outcome under study, which is COVID-19 death, and there may be a different set of confounders which should have been considered for all of these separate relationships. Because the study committed the table two fallacy, they were not able to do this in their work. Going back to previous videos and part one, of the table two fallacy series. We know that in observational studies, we simply observe who is exposed versus who is unexposed. And unlike a randomized trial, people who are exposed will be different than those who are unexposed and such differences may be associated with the outcome. And this is very easy to visualize using a diagram or a directed acyclic graph. And we know that such differences lead to confounding bias. Therefore, for all the different exposures or potential risk factors that are reported in the abstract of the Open Safety paper, there are different confounders which one may have to hypothesize and think about and ultimately adjust for in their multivariable models. And this was not done in this paper because each individual relationship was not given a lot of thought. So, not only does the Open Safely paper commit the Table 2 fallacy, it was exploratory and doomed to present fallacious findings from the start. So while the abstract reports on seven exposures, 
Their table two reports on more than 20 measures of effect or 20 adjusted hazard ratios. And none of these relationships were depicted using diagrams or a hypothesized conceptual framework. So while the hazard ratios are mutually adjusted, they are not adjusted for confounding because the variables were not assigned specific roles in the analysis and confounding bias was not given a clear consideration. Interestingly, one of the readers of the Open Safely paper, so this is not an author of the paper, but a reader of the paper after it was published, decided to draw, using Daggety, a directed acyclic graph or a diagram of what the relationship between smoking and COVID-19 death would look like given the way the multivariable model presented in Table 2 was shown. While I haven't talked about the smoking finding because it wasn't reported in the abstract, it was highly controversial in that the smoking finding found that being a current tobacco smoker was protective against COVID-19 death. It reduced your likelihood of dying in the Open Safely study. And that measure of effect, that adjusted hazard ratio for smoking, was adjusted for all the different variables in this diagram, yet this diagram did not inform the model. It was conceived after the fact. So while David Simmons of the UK clearly shows how messy this potential hypothesized reality could be, it is my interpretation that this directed acyclic graph or this hypothesized relationship is a complete mess and that the adjusted hazard ratio for smoking is largely uninterpretable due to the table two fallacy in the Open Safely paper. Along these lines, a comment was released on the Open Safely paper shortly before it was published in the journal Nature, where three epidemiology methodologists including an author of the Table 2 Fallacy paper, Daniel Westreich, along with Van Smeden and Edwards, stated that to interpret the author's Table 2 as if all of the mutually adjusted hazard ratios have in it causal interpretations, in other words, meaningful or logical interpretations, is to commit a classic Table 2 fallacy. And the screenshot shown here is of the May 25th version of this comment, but they've also released several new versions which are accessible at that link. And I think their goal is to have this comment published alongside the Open Safely paper in the journal Nature. Now here are some screenshots from their comment, at least the May 25th version of the comment when it was first released. They said that the mutually adjusted hazard ratios from a single model as in their table two, are not generally interpretable as causal effects. In other words, as meaningful effects. And they say that if you want to estimate the relationship or examine the relationship between different exposures and an outcome, that the researcher should consider the confounding structure in the form of a diagram or a directed acyclic graph for each exposure outcome pair being explored. And to account for confounding in separate multivariable models for each risk factor or exposure under study. And because the authors didn't do this, they've committed a classic table two fallacy. They also talk about the smoking findings specifically, which interestingly found based on their table two fallacy biased table two, that smoking was protective against COVID-19 death and they say such conclusions are unsupported by their results, and that the Table 2 fallacy manifests in a bunch of different issues, including uncontrolled confounding, over-adjustment, conditioning on colliders, which we won't discuss in this video, along with other issues related to measurement error, missing data, and so on. I also wanted to show this tutorial or a comment on the Open Safely paper, by the fantastic scientific communicator, Dr. Ellie Murray, where she says that an important principle of epidemiology is that we don't just want to calculate numbers. In other words, we don't just want to calculate a bunch of adjusted hazard ratios. We actually want to develop an understanding of the world. 
So instead of fitting a single multivariable model with 20 different 20 or more different adjusted hazard ratios, instead we should think of all the ways we could have gotten that number or gotten those numbers by accident or mistake and try to rule out those mistakes and then see what we learn along the way. When talking about this paper, Ellie Murray says, the problem is the authors use the same set of adjustment factors, this is that mutual adjustment problem, for all of the characteristics or exposures that they were interested in. In so much, the readers have committed the so-called table two fallacy. She also mentions the diagram that was created after the fact by David Simons in the UK, looking at the relationship between smoking and COVID-19 death, further highlighting that the table two fallacy results in inconsistencies and confusion that make the individual measures of effect from the multivariable model difficult to meaningfully interpret. So in conclusion, based on a few comments I had made in a commentary I had written on another article that might have committed the table two fallacy, this issue results in poor motivation for analyses. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the hypothesized reality? This fallacy can lead to misinterpretation. What do the odds ratios or the risk ratios or in the case of the open safely paper, the hazard ratios actually mean. Often in the case of papers that are impacted by the table two fallacy, there is no consideration of confounding and the findings are quite clearly biased and not useful for decision making. And the fallacy also makes it difficult to contextualize your results and make recommendations. So in conclusion, using the May 25th version of the Westerreich, Van Smeden, and Edwards comment, think about each exposure or each risk factor and its potential relationship with the outcome individually and fit many different multivariable models in order to better examine or more meaningfully examine the relationship between all those exposures and your outcome of interest. And doing this will be the focus of part three of this video series. My conclusions are that interpreting multiple measures of effect from a single multivariable model, often depicted in a table two, is almost always a bad idea. You should ask yourself, what are you modeling and what is the hypothesized reality or relationship between your exposure and your outcome? Start by drawing a diagram and assigning specific roles to your variables, exposure, confounder, potential effect modifier, and at the end of the day, try not to commit the table two fallacy. It is trickery. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching part two of the table two fallacy video series. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for more in the future, please subscribe, leave any further questions and comments below, and please go on to watch part three. Well, I will show you how to avoid the table two fallacy based on recommendations in various papers by clicking on the left-hand side.